Thank you all for coming and thanks to the organizers for inviting me, but not only that, also having drinks after my talk, which means that we have an audience. I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this mysterious, mysterious thing called a plant factory uh, and um, why, uh, why I'm so interested in, in it and why I think at some point uh, maybe this is going to touch your lives as well. So uh, let's start with an introduction. This is me, by the way, um, engaging in what our farmers like to call fake farming. So if you do this, this is usually when people want to take some promotional pictures of you and you go to the farm and uh, you touch the plants a little bit uh, with gloves, of course, we're very, very clean. Uh, and then uh, a farmer, uh, which you can't see in the picture, will shout fake farmer at you from the back. Um, but this is, how did I end up here? Well, I started uh, kind of a, a strange meandering through the disciplines. I started at physics, more and more theoretical, ended up uh, getting a PhD in applied mathematics. A very natural switch from that, I would say, to data science, where I worked at uh, several uh, companies and ended up in farming, of course, natural, uh, where I'm the operations data science. So I'll explain a little bit uh, what that means. So what we are is an indoor vertical hydroponic farm. So it's vertical because that way you can put it near cities. Uh, it's very efficient with space. And hydroponic means it's soil free and there are other uh, efficiencies that come with that. But why, are we, uh, why do we think that this is necessary? Um, well, pretty soon we're going to have a lot of people on this earth and they uh, all need to eat uh, and most of them live in urban areas or will be uh, living in urban areas because that's a, a pattern that we see. And in order to feed all these people, we're going to have to produce a lot of food. Uh, and the, the challenge with that is that already uh, our agricultural industry is using 70% uh, of the fresh water that we use, uh, it's going there. Uh, and it has other impacts um, on, on our uh, planet that are just not sustainable. So we need to somehow reduce uh, the footprint whilst growing much, much more. So our goal is, of course, to uh, produce more food uh, that is healthy, uh, that uh, uh, we can save water and maybe have uh, less footprint in other ways and protect our natural environment. So the way we uh, want to solve this is by uh, growing near cities, uh, don't use any pesticides at all, uh, use a lot less water, uh, that's what the, uh, the hydroponics is for. Uh, without soil means uh, you don't have to use as much water because there's less evaporation. Uh, and we want to sell uh, fresh produce uh, that can be uh, sold uh, much closer to the day of harvest. So also uh, you can reduce food waste that way. So how do we increase our output? and at the same time reduce our footprint. Well, we have, to, uh, we have to scale, and in order to scale, we have to automate. So one model uh, in which this has, of course, happened before is uh, when factories were introduced. So this is a way uh, in which you can get raw materials in. A lot of automation happens in the meantime, and the finished product is much faster to produce. Uh, it's much uh, less expensive to produce, of course, and it's of reliable quality. So in our case, a plant factory is uh, something that takes in some raw materials uh, and outputs these products. And may I say, these products are actually, uh, you can already buy them in supermarkets. Uh, unfortunately for you, you'll have to fly all the way to the States for that. So I don't recommend it at the moment until we come here. <laughs> Uh, because, uh, yeah, that's not very energy efficient. But an important feature of our plant factory is that uh, it is seasonless. So, you know, of course, uh, people like to buy seasonal uh, food because that's also more uh, energy efficient. But in our case, we are trying to uh, separate the seasonality from it and produce things in a controlled environment that we can grow efficiently at any time of year with a lot more yield per square foot uh, in an automated way and something that I'll explain later in a smart way. So what is this uh, smart farming? Well, um, it means controlling our environment in a very, very precise way. Uh, that, that's just not possible if you do it outside. So you can have light, uh, not just intensity, 
but also schedule. Uh, you can vary the temperature, uh, you can have wind blowing or not, um, you can have irrigation schedules and of course plant food that you change. Uh, you can change the composition of the air that flows around. And um, you, don't just, you don't just control all these things, you want to also know everything about these plants. So what you see here uh, in the bottom is a video of, on the left, uh, we're just filming uh, our crops. And on the right, you see a computer vision model that is estimating what is plant mass and what isn't. And on the bottom, what you see is our estimate of the canopy area, which we can use to predict yield. So there are many more things, of course, that we can do. We can uh, check for disease and all sorts of things. Um, that is much more efficient if a computer vision algorithm does it versus humans looking at all these images. But what's also very important is how we combine these two things. So here you, uh, you have these two very automated pieces, but the third thing is using them and using the fact that we can grow much more quickly and that we can know everything about them and that we can control everything about them to have very short experimental cycles. So we grow something, every day a new experiment starts. We, we start growing something, we uh, very precisely control how we grow it according to what we call a recipe, which basically states everything this many days under this much light, uh, at this temperature, with this irrigation, everything. And we measure uh, what happened to it, whether we actually managed to stick to the recipe. And then we know we can analyze all that data and that's an experiment. And this is experimentation at scale. So how do we actually make this possible? Um, because we're not an, a research institute, we're actually a business. We're in the business of selling all this crop. We are learning in the process, but we also want to sell crop. And uh, so the way we do this is by having a smart supply chain, and that's what I work on in operations. So our supply chain looks um, pretty much like this. We plan, it's always good to have a plan. We seed according to the plan. All the little crops go into the grow room where they have this controlled environment. At some point we harvest them, we pack them and ship them to our customers. And we try to analyze and forecast uh, what the orders are going to be so we can plan again, etc. But every, every of these steps, uh, a human can do a simple version, but we can make all these steps uh, more efficient and smarter. So let's focus on one. Um, that's crop placement, because we want to uh, make sure that we are very efficient with our resources, but also that our crops have the, follow the recipe and that they have the right environment. Uh, so we know from our positions a lot. So every, every of these positions are not the same. They're not identical. Positions next to each other can have different uh, airflow, different temperature, all sorts of things. So that's apart from the things you can control, there's also, of course, features of the space. And we can measure all these things very precisely. But also, from our crop, we know uh, a lot of very precise things. Like some want to have a nighttime, maybe some don't. Maybe some you can grow much more quickly by just having it be day all, uh, all the time. Um, and then, yeah, maybe some don't want to be near each other. Maybe they're somehow affecting each other. Maybe one would block the air to the other, or maybe they spread diseases to each other. Some might be, want to be in the heat, some might be actually growing faster than we expect, so we need to change our schedule to um, accommodate that. And maybe one is looking a little stressed, so we might want to have uh, changes uh, in the schedule as, uh, as a crop uh, starts to look stressed and we want to move to another schedule. So. This kind of problem is just matching these crops to positions, which you can see as a bipartite graph where uh, the nodes on the, water, uh, on the one hand are all our crops and on the other hand are the positions. And we want to uh, minimize a cost uh, of uh, using resources, um, placing crops in the wrong environment or being inefficient in, in other ways. So, what we want to find is a uh, matching 
between all our crops and these positions. Uh, and the actual solution looks like an assignment ma matrix. So you can assign crop A to position one, for example, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this is going to be quite a, a sparse matrix. Uh, and this kind of problem is called a discrete optimization problem. So this sort of problem is very uh, common in uh, manufacturing and scheduling, for instance. Um, and in this case, I've used Google OR tools uh, to solve it. But there are many other solvers out there. Uh, this is a very convenient sort of package to start with. So let's look in this case um, what kind of uh, constraints we might have. So there are some obvious constraints, namely you cannot put uh, two crops in the same position. Um, well, that one should be pretty obvious. And you can see that that uh, in, in our matrix means that we have a row that sums up to more than one. Another constraint is, of course, we want to match all of our crops. We don't want to just leave them out there. So if you have a column that is all zeros, that is also not a good thing. But you, you will see it's perfectly fine to have rows that are all zeros. That just means we leave a position empty. So here you can say, all right, how do I solve this? All right, I, I make it a feasible problem. I move, um, I move one uh, crop from one position to another one. Uh, and I just assign one random position to the missing one. But this is not a very efficient solution. You can see there's two open spots there, so you might want to move those other two crops in there, possibly. But this is, of course, a very, um, very simplified version. I haven't used any of the data I showed you, um, and you can see maybe that there's a lot of combinatorics uh, involved here. So the problem gets more and more complex. So um, here, and here there's different ways you can go about making this better. You can just, you can try to be uh, very efficient or you can try to be very expressive. And um, it depends a little bit on your problem, which you want to be. So uh, a cost, adding a cost means you're more expressive. So in the real world, um, things aren't really constraints except for the overfilling, like you can't put two, two things in the same uh, spot. But many other things are not really constrained. You can just model them as maybe a very high cost. So maybe you don't want to exclude all possibilities if it's entirely possible that it could be uh, even the best solution because it outweighs a lot of other costs. But on the other hand, um, constraints do make your model a lot more efficient. So very often, uh, if you, if you look at, so our scale of uh, farms is pretty huge. So that means that all these solutions are going to be uh, like very hard to compute. Uh, so having all these complex costs instead of constraints is going to be uh, maybe not the ideal, uh, ideal thing to do. Especially uh, in a farm in which situations change all the time. Uh, and you don't want to have uh, two hours of computing, computation time for a two minute decision. So um, the yeah so let let's take that approach for now and say why what if we want to uh, find uh, one part of the solution which we want to simplify uh, and one way you can simplify uh, a, a combinatorial uh, optimization problem is by exploiting symmetry you never want to have uh, a problem that has symmetry because if uh, if there is one option and this option, and they're actually the same uh, from a cost perspective, then you have done too much computation. So in this case, you could say, well, similar crops go to similar positions, and I'm only matching just the groups uh, together. But this makes, of course, an assumption. Maybe you don't, you don't want to treat the similar crops the same. Maybe you want to run an experiment on them. So I've told you a lot about uh, combinatorics and optimization, or a little bit in any case. But where's the AI uh, in this whole story? Well, it's pretty much everywhere. So for example, let's look at the planning and the seeding. Uh, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of machine learning that can go into forecasting. For example, uh, on the right side, we have uh, the most information. Because on the sales side, uh, well, we, we, we have a bit less uh, influence, but on the right side, we have all these sensors. 
So for example, the computer vision I told you about and all the other sensors. So we could uh, use AI to, uh, uh, to, to help us predict a few things there. But uh, actually in reality, when a lot of things change and you're not really at steady state yet, human partnerships are actually uh, really useful. Uh, just utilizing human predictions in a way uh, that you can later replace them with an automated predictor is uh, it's a very efficient way to scale. So you start by replacing something like computer vision, which is really hard for a human, uh, and only at the end you start replacing other things. So our partners uh, in the supply chain and what, we, what they care about are agricultural science. Um, they care a lot about whether we comply to recipes, but also they want us to search recipe space. So if we're doing really well uh, in, our, in our production and we're definitely going to make our uh, orders, they want us to explore a little bit more the recipe space. Um, automation and robotics, they care mostly, of course, about mission time. They don't want the automation to have to do too many things, if, if not necessary. Um, operations care mostly about efficiency there, so process flow. Uh, supply chain, they care about putting most as, mu as much of the uh, harvest as possible towards orders and not waste anything. But they can help us as well. So agricultural science can tell us, well, if you mess a little bit up in the lighting, that's fine. You can make it up later. Or if you want to make sure you irrigate well, uh, make sure you focus on the first few days. Those are the most important. Um, and for example, uh, automation can give us maybe outside the box solutions. So we come up with a recommendation. We notice that they tend to do things a little bit differently and we can just ask them about it and say, all right, uh, how would you solve this as a human? Operations can of course foresee issues with labor or they can maybe see that some machines are being used a lot one part of the day and then not used later. So maybe we should adjust our schedules. And supply chain can do order forecasting very well, obviously because salespeople uh, affect the thing that we're predicting. So naturally, uh, we should ask them first. So uh, one final piece of advice. Um, I, w I always say, just like uh, um, test-driven development, uh, we should actually be doing reporting driven automation. So uh, we first want to uh, report on the thing that we're trying to improve on and make sure that we understand all the KPIs that we are trying to hit uh, before, before we actually write a single line of code. Uh, so one reason is, of course, we know what the baseline is and we know whether we're actually improving, but this can also give us hints towards a solution. Maybe we thought about uh, treating it as an optimization, discrete optimization problem, but maybe it's actually another another way. And finally, uh, reporting can also mean that you write uh, reporting tests. So maybe if they if somebody uh, doesn't use your recommendations, you want to be alerted. Uh, you want to ask them why, and you want to learn from that. Uh, and of course, you have to make a lot of simplifying assumptions to even be able to solve all these problems. So you want to report on whether these uh, or alert uh, when any of these assumptions fail. And finally, uh, let's end on a, on a wise, uh, wise quote. Uh, and this is something I say, well, pretty much every day. It is very hard to automate a changing process. Basically, you have to uh, write a solution and it's going to get more and more complex and you have to be willing to just throw it all uh, in the bin very quickly because when the underlying processes change, automation can be, uh, can be a bit of a challenge. And on that note, I would like to thank you.